Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we get to enjoy a double header. The first story that we will read is from Alan Alexander Milne, the same author of the Winnie the Pooh stories. This story is titled A Train of Thought and comes to us from the book If I May. The second story is actually a poem titled The Song of Steam, written by George Washington Cutter and comes to us from the book Great Inventions and Discoveries, written by Willis Duff Piercy. The other day, we were talking about things to do for the summer. One program that we have here in Michigan is called the Michigan Activity Pass. This is how it works in a nutshell. You go to the website, look through the list of places to go, like museums and attractions, use your library card, and you can get discounted tickets and or sometimes free stuff. It's pretty cool. We have used it a few times now. I'll include a link to that website in the show notes. Anyway, I was going through that list, and I found a museum called the Lost Railway Museum in Grass Lake, Michigan. We didn't really need to check out any passes or get any discounts because admission is free. We went there yesterday, and it was pretty cool. In the early 1900s, people got around on streetcars until... In the early 1900s, Henry Ford brought about the mass production of cars. After he produced the Model T, the demand for streetcars dropped considerably. Then it went pretty much extinct. Well, in Grass Lake, there's a group of people trying to preserve the history of the streetcars and the history of mass transportation. It was a pretty cool little museum, so if you're in the area, I definitely recommend it. I'll include the link to the museum in the show notes, as well as a YouTube link for a video from a guy who recently visited. I think that pretty much covers the reason I chose today's stories, and also everything that has happened since the last episode. Now, let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. On the same day, I saw two unsettling announcements in the paper. The first said simply, underneath a suitable photograph, that the skiing season was now in full swing in Switzerland. The second explained elaborately why it cost more to go from London to the Riviera and back than from the Riviera to London and back. Both announcements unsettled me considerably. They would upset anybody for whom the umbrella season in London was just opening, and who was wondering what was the cost of a return ticket to Manchester. At first, I amused myself with trying to decide whether I should prefer it to be the Riviera or Switzerland this Christmas. Switzerland won, not because it is more invigorating, but because I had just discovered a woolen helmet and a pair of skiing boots, relics of an earlier visit. I am thus equipped for Switzerland already, whereas for the Riviera, I should want several new suits. One of the chief beauties of Switzerland, other than the mountains, is that it is so uncritical of the visitor's wardrobe. So long as he has a black coat for the evenings, it demands nothing more. In the daytime, he may fall about in whatever he pleases. Indeed, it is almost an economy to go there now and work off some of one's moth-collecting khaki on it. 
The socks, which are impossible with our civilian clothes, could renew their youth as the middle pair of three inside a pair of skiing boots. Yet to whichever I went this year, Switzerland or the Riviera, I think it would be money wasted. I am one of those obvious people who detest an uncomfortable railway journey, and the journey this year will certainly be uncomfortable. But I am something more than this. I am one of those uncommon people who enjoy a comfortable railway journey. I mean that I enjoy it as an entertainment in itself, not only as a relief from the hair shirts of previous journeys. I would much sooner go by wagon lit from Calais to Monte Carlo in 20 hours than my magic carpet in 20 seconds. I am even looking forward to my journey to Manchester, supposing that there is no great rush for the place on my chosen day. The scenery as one approaches Manchester may not be beautiful, but I shall be quite happy in my corner facing the engine. Nowhere can I think so happily as in a train. I am not inspired, nothing so uncomfortable as that. I am never seized with a sudden idea for a masterpiece, nor from a sudden plan for some new enterprise. My thoughts are just pleasantly reflective. I think of all the good deeds I have done, and, when those give out, of all the good deeds I am going to do. I look out of the window and say lazily to myself, how jolly to live there, and a little farther on, how jolly not to live there. I see a cow, and I wonder what it is like to be a cow, and I wonder whether the cow wonders what it is like to be me, and perhaps by this time we have passed on to a sheep, and I wonder if it is more fun being a sheep. My mind wanders on in a way which would annoy Pellman a good deal, but it wanders on quite happily, and the clankety-clank of the train adds a very soothing accompaniment. So soothing indeed that at any moment I can close my eyes and pass into a pleasant state of sleep. But this entertainment which my train provides for me is doubly entertaining if it be but the overture to greater delights. If some magic property which the train possesses, whether it be the motion of the clankety-clank, makes me happy even when I am thinking about a cow, is it any wonder that I am happy in thinking about the delightful new life to which I am traveling? We are going to the Riviera, but I have had no time as yet in which to meditate properly upon that delightful fact. I have been too busy saving up for it, doing work in advance for it, buying cloth for it. Between London and Dover, I have been worrying, perhaps, about the crossing. Between Dover and Calais, my worries have come to a head, but when I step into the train at Calais, then at last I can give myself up with a whole mind to the contemplation of the happy future. So long as the train does not stop, so long as nobody goes in or out of my carriage, I care not how many hours the journey takes. I have enough happy thoughts to fill them. All this, as I said, is not at all Pellman's idea of success in life. One should be counting cows instead of thinking of them. Although presumably a train journey would seem in any case a waste of time to the man who succeeds. But to those of us to whom it is no more a waste of time than any other pleasant form of entertainment, the train service to which we have had to submit lately has been doubly distressing. The bliss of traveling from London to Manchester was torn from us and we are given purgatory instead. Things are a little better now in England. If one chooses the right day, one can still come sometimes upon the old happiness, but not yet on the continent. In the happy days before the war, the journey out was almost the best part of Switzerland on the Riviera. I must wait until those days come back again.
Song of Steam. Harness me down with your iron bands. Be sure of your curb and rein. For I scorn the power of your puny hands as the tempest scorns a chain. How I laughed as I lay concealed from sight for many a countless hour at the childish boast of human might and the pride of human power. When I saw an army upon the land, a navy upon the seas, creeping along a snail-like band or waiting the wayward breeze, when I marked the peasant faintly reel with the toil which he daily bore, as he feebly turned the tardy wheel, or tugged at the weary oar. When I measured the panting courser's speed, the flight of the courier dove, as they bore the law a king decreed, or the lines of impatient love, I could not but think how the world would feel, as these were outstripped afar, when I should be bound to the rushing keel, or chained to the flying car. Ha ha, they found me out at last, they invited me forth at length, and I rushed to my throne with a thunder blast, and I laughed in my iron strength. Oh, then ye saw a wondrous change on the earth and the ocean wide, where now my fiery armies range, nor wait for wind and tide. Hurrah, hurrah, the waters o'er, the mountains steep decline, Time, space, have yielded to my power, the world, the world is mine. The rivers the sun hath earliest blessed, or those where his beams decline, the giant streams of the queenly west and the orient floods divine. The ocean pales where'er I sweep, I in my strength rejoice, and the monsters of the briny deep cower trembling at my voice. I carry the wealth and the lord of earth, the thoughts of his godlike mind. The wind lags after my going forth, the lightning is left behind. In the darksome depths of the fathomless mine, my tireless arm doth play, where the rocks never saw the sun decline or the dawn of the glorious day. I bring earth's glittering jewels up from the hidden caves below, and I make the fountain's granite cup with a crystal gush o'erflow. I blow the bellows, I forge the steel, in all the shops of trade. I hammer the oar and turn the wheel where my arms of strength are made. I manage the furnace, the mill, the mint. I carry, I spin, I weave. And all my doings I put into print on every Saturday eve. I have no muscle to weary, no breast to decay, no bones to be laid on the shelf, and soon I intend you may go and play while I manage this world myself. But harness me down with your iron bands, be sure of your curb and rein, for I scorn the power of your puny hands as the tempest scorns a chain. Listen now, Tranquility Base here. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read another exciting story. Today's music was provided by the artist Analog by Nature, and the audio clips were provided from NASA. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com, or you can follow the links in the show notes. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you get your podcast or on iTunes and tell a friend. Thank you for your patronage, and as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Mission complete, Houston. 
After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop.